WordPress community there. Uh, by day, I'm a senior digital project manager for a company called Travel Tripper. Uh, so we deal with boutique hotel websites, uh, not on WordPress. We have our own custom CMS. Uh, so I'm excited to be on this panel and uh, shoot to. Can I swear? Is that okay? <laughs> shoot the crap about uh, design and stuff. So yeah. thanks for having me. My name is Mary Beth Amaral, and um, I have a background in graphic design. Um, I'm a web designer at Lynchpin. We are a digital agency located right outside of Providence, Rhode Island. We build awesome websites on WordPress. Um, I also am a organizer for the WordPress Rhode Island Meetup Group and um, help organize the Ford Camp Rhode Island, which is coming up in September. So you should check it out. <laughs> Hey everyone, I'm Mel Choice. I'm a product designer at Automatic. Uh, I come from more of a uh, like a UI UX background, uh, and a little bit of, like web design. Um, and so right now I'm working full time on uh, WordPress core, so like the the software that powers WordPress. Uh, and I'm the customization focus lead, uh, design lead for core this year. <laughs> So I'm I'm um, I'm leading a focus on customization this year. So if any of you have heard of Gutenberg, uh, we're helping out with that, and then we're gonna like extend it further. Uh, if you haven't heard of Gutenberg yet, you should check it out. Uh, it's gonna be the new editor uh, eventually. And I'm Erin Harris. I'm a graphic designer and marketing consultant. Uh, in house for a long time now. seen sort of the design trends of the the web 2.0 if anyone you know can, can date themselves back to that of like the glossy buttons uh, you know the very like slick uh, look and then it kind of went like clean if everyone got sick of the busy you know ugly gradients um, to like this clean minimal look um, and now things like gradients in a softer fashion are coming back um, and my one gripe of design trends is like the hamburger menu on desktop that's like the obvious one. I'm sure everyone who's laughing about it knows about it. It's it's, it's good on mobile. It makes sense uh, in the mobile sense. Uh, but when you're on a desktop website or anything above tablet, uh, to me that's that's one extra click. Uh, and it's super annoying where people are seeing that as like the trend. Uh, and, yeah. and some others are sort of the, the parallax and the ambient video. And those are, those are some trends. Uh, and really, I guess I'm always going back to analytics of does it does the design justify it? Like, why do we have to have this video just to make it look cool? Uh, does it convert? You know, is it ex expressing what the true communication there is? 
So, you know, that's basically, in my opinion, that's kind of what the trend is. Does it, it may look cool, but does it really work, you know? I have to admit, I feel a little bit bad about that one because we introduced video headers in core. <laughs> like, so now, like, if you if you make a WordPress theme, you could, uh, like, easily and natively add a, uh, like, a video header support. So, making that trend worse for everyone. <laughs> yeah, there are definitely a couple of site, uh, the sites that have, like, things that they're like, look, we can put motion, yeah. and you're like, you really don't need that yeah. at all. I keep hoping that, like, gratuitous animation will go away, but it is still strong. <laughs> when you were talking about the hamburger menu, one thing that makes me absolutely nuts is when it, it's clearly been designed so it'll, so it'll scale, but when you look at it on your phone, the menu, uh, or, like, other items, a lot of times it's the sharing buttons will overlap with the content, and there is no way to resize the content. You, you can't do anything, and there's forever like a share on Facebook thing like, down the side, and you're like, I want to know what words there are underneath it. Like, I can't read it, and I realize that that's not necessarily a design problem, yeah. but it's a choice someone's made somewhere trying to get either analytics or you know, trying to get some kind of conversion that's causing a problem in design, so I'd, I'd like to see that stop. <laughs> I actually wonder if, if sharing buttons will go away eventually. They're very gratuitous. I, I think to some degree we're gonna, people want that because they want the social proof. And, you know. But it's funny because I feel like whenever I share something on social media, I copy and paste the link. Like I don't okay. even, I don't ever use the buttons. Yeah, so, yeah I never do Because I want to curate what I'm writing. I feel like I don't trust them. Yeah, yeah. exactly. It, it is like a weird trust yeah. thing. Plus, wouldn't you feel lame if you posted something on your site and it has like three shares on Twitter and like one share on Facebook? Like nobody wants to see that. You only yeah. want the numbers when it's been shared yeah. <laughs> like a hundred thousand times. That's true. So yeah. Yeah. a lot of a lot of marketing managers think that's like super important to have like social share buttons because they think they think people will use them. You know, maybe they do, but I guess I'll go back to my last one with look at the analytics and see if people are clicking on things because. Again, it's just another eyesore, or you know, the JavaScript codes that you're putting in there, or the plugin that you're using, might conflict with the hamburger menu or other things. So, you know, where's the value there if it's really just breaking your site and not converting? You know, clearly we could talk about this <laughs> yeah, yeah. all day. This but would be a this, whole this different is, session. This isn't going to turn into a venting session. <laughs> no, it could. Maybe next. Time. I have I have two trends that I actually really do like. Oh, okay. Go ahead. If we want to, if we want to inject some positivity. Um, oh, I'm so I'm not so I really think that like. Hopefully it's not a trend, it's a movement, but we're see I think we're seeing a lot of work towards performance, uh, especially front-end performance, and like making sure that the websites that we build are faster. Uh, and I think um, people like uh, Lara Hogan, uh, who's a designer, um, used to be at Etsy, I think she just joined Adobe, uh, has talked a lot about uh, designing for performance and how like as designers we can also uh, impact the performance of a site, it's not just up to our developers. Uh, so that I think is a great trend to see. And um, the kind of like modern web technologies that we're, we're seeing emerge now are also making it easier to do like really nice like editorialized magazine style layouts again. Like I feel like we're getting to a point where we can finally replicate print on the web uh, in a way that's like super cool, responsive, like really elegant, nice. So that's exciting. I like that one of those things is about the thought process too. It's not just about do we like it? What color is it? You know, there's, there is more that we do other than make it look okay. In relation to that, about the thought process and being more conceptual, um, kind of just this past year I've seen a lot about signing with empathy and all these bloggers writing about empathy and it's kind of this new buzzword in the industry. So it's like, what is this? What is this all about? And um, just kind of has to do with like a really user-centered design approach instead of, you know, it's more than just who it is and what your demographic is, their age or, you know, where they live and what their location is, but designing for what their pain points are, what their goals are. Um, so really seeing that shift happen in that UX process or that design process, I think is pretty cool and people are just starting to pay more attention to that. Yeah, more, and more, I think, oh, go ahead. <laughs> I think it's really but, starting to make more people money too, because especially in a, like an app-centric world, the apps that are better designed end up being adopted more and end up making more money. Um, so like, especially since there's just, there's so many apps, <laughs> um, and if it if it's not designed well, people are gonna ditch it pretty pretty much immediately. So 
It's a good money maker. Yeah. Yeah. Gotta invest in design. And something you were saying about uh, it, it's not empathy in a way, but even really simple things like I've noticed on a couple of the apps I have, the navigation is moving down to the bottom. And at first I was like, this is really dumb. Like, why have you done this to me? Because I keep going to the top. And then I realized it's because if I'm holding my phone, that's the natural spot. It's like, that is super smart. And it, it's taking, it's the same idea of taking, taking that thought of how is it being used, not just like mentally how are we using it, but physically how are we holding the phone? So are we using it to catch a bus, or are we using it while we're like sitting down and like paying attention or that? Uh, but that brings us to something else we were talking about, which is how do you balance beautiful design with a really good user experience? So how do you make sure that you're doing both of those things? I mean, in terms of like user experience, I would definitely say research and testing are your friend. Um, making sure that like you know there is a use case for whatever you're trying to build uh, is is what you're building actually going to solve the pain points that you're you know you're hoping your users will are encountering now. Um, and I don't know necessarily know that it's really hard to to balance the visual aspects with the experience until you start getting into like oh, the text is really small because it like looks nice that way, or like the text is really light because it looks nice that way, which is a trap I've fallen into a lot, like a lighter gray text for, for like, um... Black background versus... Okay. Like on a white background. Sorry, so I thought you were talking about something. Okay, yeah, but just making sure that like what you're building is, or what you're designing is actually accessible and like easy to view on screens that are uh, lower quality, higher quality, et cetera awful flashbacks to when you had to figure out what the resolution of the screen was and you had to decide it for like 87 different. It was a bad time. Uh, and some of you were probably too young to remember that, so <laughs> be happy about that. This site works best on 800 by 600. Oh god. <laughs> it was like, it was like <laughs> back when <laughs> GeoCities was a thing. Like, if you don't know what I'm talking about, you're better off that way. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, so another thing uh, we were talking about also is if, what advice would you give to a designer who's either coming maybe from print or from, uh, from other web design who doesn't use WordPress? So if they're coming in to start using WordPress as their back end, what would be something that would make it easier for them to transition into that? I think to set the very core of thinking of it uh, in a grid, we're using some sort of structured system. Uh, you know, WordPress obviously is a beast of its own uh, from a functionality and technical standpoint. Uh, but I think, uh, you know, translating it from print to web, uh, there's a there's a transition phase and there's a learning curve. Uh, it's not completely far off. Obviously, it's it's design and communicating ideas, but uh, at the same time, it's it's another uh, medium, another tool. Uh, where I think uh, adapting uh, to responsive grids. In other words, you know, it's print obviously is is pretty structured, uh, and web is structured, but it should be flexible and scalable at the same time. And um, definitely coming from a print background, the grid is huge, and it was a pretty easy transition for me going into designing for the web and using things like the foundation 12 column grid. It was just such a, you know, Simple transition. Um, also, just communication you had mentioned as well, and I think you know, as print designers, we learn to really critique each other and talk about our work really well, and um, that's something that translates to any other industry, really, um, regardless of whether you're going into web design or something else. Um, just being able to really talk about your work, um, making informed decisions, um, is super important. So, um, I don't know if that really answers the question, but I think it's still still really relevant for someone who's you know making that shift. It's not. Not super scary. There's a lot of commonalities between the two. Yeah, being able, being able to back up why why you've done what you've done, but also to to accept create uh, constructive criticism. I mean, I think that's mm -hmm. across the board yeah. something important, something that I don't know that you get enough of in in school if you've gone that route. I mean, it's not specific to to WordPress, but. I think you're right, especially when you're learning something new. You know, if someone says, well, if you 
here's how you should be doing it. It's not, you've done it wrong, never do it that way again. It's, you know, because they're trying to teach you either a better way to do it or an easier way to do it. Or maybe you just did do it wrong. It's, it's all. Awesome. I would say also um, experimenting with WordPress. Like, sometimes, um, especially if I'm trying to test, like, a new feature or even sometimes I'll test, like, other CMSs. I'll take a website, uh, usually a simple website, uh, and then redesign it, or like just like grab all the content and then throw it in like a like a local or a test site, and just try to like build that site. And it's a good way to like figure out if there are themes that work really well for you, um, if there's a page builder that you you know you really get the hang of pretty quickly. Uh, it's also good if you start doing like some basic template tweeting, tweaking, just like looking at your templates, so you kind of start to get a feeling for how, how WordPress is put together, not even necessarily from like a screen saver on, <laughs> from like a code code point of view, but just like like I know that I need to design these kinds of templates. Like I know that there's gonna be, you know, a category archive page or stuff like that. So just like getting familiar with WordPress. I'm gonna have to turn off my screen saver. <laughs> <laughs> and I think too it's it is another sort of controversial topic, but um, going from print to web, kind of dipping your toes in and learning some basic HTML and CSS is um, always a good thing. I think it's important to know what you're designing for and how things function and work. You don't need to know everything, obviously. Um, or even just working really closely with the developer or team of developers, because they can really help guide you and let you know what, you know, what the parameters are, what the restrictions are, if any. Um, things like that are always super important as well, so kind of just you know, dipping your toes in and trying things out. Um, can't yeah, I agree with poking around and kind of figuring out what you can change. Uh, I remember, that's what I first started doing. I would pick a theme and be like, all right, I understand this, like, clearly this code is this color. And I, I got very excited when I figured out, like, I could change the font or I could change the color. I couldn't, I couldn't figure out what the rest of the thing did. But, you know, just little steps like that, you have to start somewhere. So that's a good way to do it without feeling completely overwhelmed by it, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I just want to kind of echo what both of you said about uh, testing, sort of A-B testing uh, as one example, uh, but definitely definitely diving into that to, to kind of see what's working and what's not, besides the whole analytic side of it, uh, which I'm going to keep honing in on for the rest of this talk. Um, and then the second part of it was uh, picking a developer's brain. You know, as a designer, obviously, we're, we think in such a different way, or not such a different way, but, you know, our brain is trained visually. Um, but diving into the code and trying to dissect the structure of a, of a line of code or a theme uh, or looking at CSS, uh, getting your feet wet with that uh, will help tremendously. Um, but also working with uh, very intelligent team members that could help guide you. Um, you know, they're not going to teach you how to code and be a front, front end or back end developer, but you should have a basic understanding of HTML5 and CSS, for example, just you know the core basics of how the front end of a website is constructed. You don't have to dive into JavaScript if you don't want to. I don't want to ever. <laughs> but it's funny that's similar to something I always used to say uh, as, a, as a print designer is that you should find a local printer and be really nice to them and make them your best friend because they will use your ass at some point. And I did, certainly. Uh, and you learn a lot in that process. Because again, that's something we don't necessarily learn in school, is that learning process. And I think that's the same thing. That would be also be true with a developer. Um, you know, find someone you can say, like, here's something I've done, or here's something I've learned, or you know, can you explain what this big mess of stuff is supposed to do? Because that's their specialty. So, and if they can explain it to you and you understand it, then you know they're good at it. Right. And same thing goes the other way. If they're, can, can we actually have like a show of hands of how many designers are in the room? <coughs> okay, majority of you guys. How many front end developers? Oh, okay, that's a good amount too. Any back end developers here? Yeah, there we go. That's a good mix. And everybody else? Entrepreneurs, copywriters, business owners. Yeah, all right. That was a good survey. <laughs> also make friends with copywriters. Yes. Yeah. I Great love point. copywriters. Basically, make <laughs> friends with the people who do the things that you don't do. Yeah. Because you will be expected to do all of the things all the time. And you can't. Like you I, just you exactly. just can't. so 
find a good developer, find a good copywriter, find a good printer, <coughs> like just find people you work with well who are awesome at what they do, and that will be valuable yeah. later on, whether yeah. you're in-house or, or working as a freelancer, like, that's yeah. the best way to do. And if you can't find a person to work with, if you're not part of a team where you, you can't somehow reach out to a local person, there's hundreds and thousands of websites that you could learn things from. So don't be afraid to dive in. And on a Saturday or Sunday when you find yourself with an hour or two of free time somehow, um, you know, don't be afraid to, to kind of have a little research project because it's, it's going to go a long way and it will contribute to your design career and it will help you become a better designer, for sure. And sometimes professional organizations have stuff like that too, depending on, <coughs> depending on what exactly it is you're trying to learn, but that can be worth WordPress are pretty, there's a Boston one, there's uh, the Rhode Island one, I'm sure there are other ones within the New England area, um, but meetups are a great place because there's always time for networking and meeting other people who may know more about WordPress than you do or have some of these other expertises like copywriting or SEO or um, be a really strong front-end developer who you can kind of pick their brains and learn from. Um, so if you are just starting out, it's always a great platform to learn more. And they're usually free. So. <laughs> All right, we've been talking for a while. Uh, so you want to open up to the questions? Sure. All right. If you get, can you guys come up to the mic if you have some yes. questions? That way we can get the audio of it. If anyone has questions, there we go. No, I was going to say, we can keep talking. <laughs> yeah. There's we're, one we're brave good. soul. We have a lot of questions. <laughs> so. Hello there. I'm currently in school in Miami, but I'm here doing an internship. I just want to know if I'm, I'm doing a front-end development track currently, but I do like the design, and I would like love to learn more. Do you know any recommendations on resources for learning design principles and such? So uh, there's a newsletter, Hack Design. So it's like a newsletter class. Uh, you sign up, and then I think it's once a week you get a lesson plan. Um, there's also a bunch of writers that I would follow, uh, like designers who write. Um, so. Uh, Verse.co, it's uh, Ewan, I forget his last name, but he's, he's really awesome. He does uh, case studies, he writes every week. Um, and uh, Julie Zhou, Zhao um, from Facebook, she's the uh, one of the design leads of Facebook, if not the design lead. She's amazing. She also writes a lot. Uh, it's uh, Z H O U. Um, and yeah, her her like medium is is great, and uh, she she also has an email newsletter that I follow. Actually, I'm not like a newsletter person, but I follow a lot of designers on, on newsletters. <laughs> I, I follow a lot of them on Twitter because I spend way too much time on Twitter. That's it. Um, but yeah, I mean that that's a less formal way to do it. Uh, but finding people, like you said, who are writing about it. Uh, one thing that I did when I first got out of college that was really helpful was I joined an online forum and like we, we all still talk to each other and I won't tell you how many years ago that was. Uh, but one of the best things about that was that I learned from people who were in varying stages of their career and something we did a lot of was critiquing each other's work. Uh, so that's another really good way uh, another really good way to kind of learn, you know, at, as you're working on stuff. So, you know, you know, put something together of your own, ask for some feedback on it, and again, it's a it's a less formal way of doing it, but that that's a good way to kind of start doing something and and learning at the same time rather than just you know reading a bunch of stuff first. I mean, I am for reading things, but <laughs> not not to just you know, despair is that, but that's another way you can go too. Yeah, I, I think going back to um, what Mel was saying about reading about design, not just learning the classes. I mean, there's some probably some great classes online, but reading about what some successful uh, designers are doing or what their thought process and approach is, um, I've learned a lot from, and then you can interpret that in your own design aesthetic or design approach. Um, and that's sort of how you, you know, for me personally, that's how I've learned things or learned new styles and tested and tried new things was reading about the core concepts uh, and the approach on something, but, you know, executing it differently um, more than, you know, 
not copying someone, but using them as, a, as inspiration, you know? Yeah, case studies are really good for that, too. Like, a lot, you know, we've seen a lot of uh, major brands or teams that have rebranded recently, and someone always writes an article about it, at the very least. Uh, sometimes those design teams will release their own their own information about how they went through the process, so that's sometimes helpful to read, too, because you can see how they thought about it, uh, and I, I find that can be really helpful, too, from universities. Uh, BU did re uh, refresh their brand a couple years back, and I was super excited when the brand manual came out. I was the only one, but that's okay. Uh, but, like, they talked about certain problems they had, like, how do you take this brand and extend it across a million different schools and combinations and centers and things like that. So there are a lot of, like, unique problems that happen in higher ed in terms of their branding that you can learn about that way that you wouldn't necessarily see in, like, more consumer brand. Yeah, and my did that, too, yeah. Oh, the, yeah. The so, media lab. The media lab, yeah. They, that was a whole, that's a good one, the media lab at MIT. They're, uh, I can't think where it's posted, but there's, there are some good write-ups about that one, too. I'm just looking at examples online, too, not that, like, award sites aren't always, some, a lot of them are paid, so it's hard to kind of justify, but just to browse the internet and get some ideas, um, you know, there's there's plenty of award sites out there that you could see some award-winning ideas, um, but it's, it's good to look and just see examples um, in addition to reading. Dribble, Dribble's a great example, or Behance um, are some good ones. Um, even like Pinterest, I'll like look on Pinterest for random things that I'm like, just want to see a library of resources for and you can kind of go down the rabbit hole of the internet there so you never know what you might find. Um, Envision is a great resource too. We use it as a tool um, at Lynchpin um, but it is really geared towards designers so if you subscribe to their blog um, they'll actually send you an email like uh, I probably get an email a day from them I don't even know with a whole bunch of different articles and posts and um, they're all really relevant and a lot of them have to do with designing for the web. So yeah, the, the Envision blog is really Sorry. It's, it's one of the few that I'm like, yes, I really should read this now <laughs> instead of sending to Evernote and having it pile up yeah. in my, <laughs> my digital pile of things I'll never read. Uh, one other thing I recommend is actually just copying things you see. So don't post them anywhere. <laughs> but but yeah, like, just, just take a design, like take a screenshot of it and try to replicate it in Sketch or Photoshop or Illustrator or whatever tool you're using. Um, just to like kind of figure out how, how it's composed, like the kind of spacing, um, you could try to eyeball it and then like overlay it and see how accurate you were, or you could just try to like trace over it if you're just starting out. Yeah, yeah that's yeah. a good idea too, so you're also not just focusing on the, the tools, because like you said, a lot of the classes you'll find online tend to focus on how to use Photoshop to do this thing, or how to use Illustrator to do this other thing, and yeah, you need to know how to use the tools, but like anybody can sit down and figure out how to use Photoshop at some point, but if you don't know what the you know the foundations are, <laughs> kind of what's the point? Is uh, anybody else? Yeah. Hi. And also, yeah, feel free to line up too. Yeah. Okay. Cool. The lady behind you. Um, so there was a really great conversation on Twitter a few months ago among developers talking about uh, silly mistakes that they've made professionally. So in the same vein, could you share some professional mistakes that you've made and how you recovered from them as designers? <laughs> I've been fired from a job before uh, because A, I wasn't too good at it, <laughs> but also B, I had an ego and an attitude. Uh, and that is something that I think a lot of designers struggle with is like having that kind of ego or attachment to your work. Like you really need to like let go of your work and um, like not take feedback personally. Uh, so that's probably the biggest area of growth I've had to focus on is, is making sure that like I'm receptive to feedback, that I uh, like take that feedback and, and act on it and that I, I, I don't have an ego about what I design. I think that's, I think that's a really good point. Too, is that if we were just doing it to please ourselves, then it would be art and not design. Yeah. Uh, and I, I think that's that's something that takes a little getting used to, uh, and also getting getting used to uh, kind of defending your work, why you've done what you've done, but also being able mm. to incorporate.
incorporate the criticism that you might get from it. Uh, and also when you're, when you're uh, explaining your work, focusing on the goals rather than walking somebody down a page. I did this so much, so many times when I was in agency land. Like, oh, and at the top we have a header, and in the head, like, <laughs> obviously you can see it. I don't need to explain it to you. <laughs> and it's blue because I thought that would be pretty, <laughs> or it's blue because that's your your dog's favorite color. Like, don't do any of that stuff. Yeah. Because yeah. you'll never you'll never get by and when you need to back up why you've done what you've done with with a reasonable. Like you need some kind of data or something mm -hmm. other than I did it because I could. Yeah, there's reason behind the art. Basically, there's there's meaning that you're trying to communicate something. You're trying to convert them into a customer or a user. Or, you know, you're build if you're building a website, it's a marketing tool. So there's there's reasons for every decision. Otherwise, it's just art. You know, exactly. and, and that someone told me that's you know like that's what separates the art between commerce or whatever the saying goes. But um, Going back to the question, um, stay open-minded, similar to your, you know, don't have an ego, but stay open-minded uh, because that's what's going to help sort of uh, morph you as a designer, or you know, stay flexible with your, with your, with your uh, approach. Um, and you know, going back to the old days of like designing before WordPress even came out or something, you know, like in Dreamweaver and you know, Notepad. Uh, dating myself, I guess, but um, <laughs> but to me. Yeah, it feels very long ago. But yeah, but you know, back then, you're just starting out, and you think you know what you want. You think you know how you should design something until you get it out into the wild, and people start interacting with it. People start using it, even if it's a you know an app, a product, uh, or a, a tool, a marketing tool like a website. Uh, that's going to shift your design thinking and approach. So when you go into client meetings and you're trying to sell them the design and pitch the design, you'll have you know, reasoning and, and understanding of their goals and, and how you can kind of get in the client's head of explaining why you did what you did uh, to help sell it and make the client happy and make money. That's why we're all here, right? Kind of related to that, um, user test your prototypes. So if you are down to maybe like two designs or if your client is like, oh, I think we should do this and you're like, I think we should do this, pitch them like, oh, how about we test both of those ideas and see which one is easier to use, see which one. I don't know, makes more money if, if you're in a phase where you can be A-B testing. Um, just a, a little trick. Yeah, figure out figure out what that goal is that they want and then test for it because usually if you provide some kind of data like that that's objective, most reasonable people will like will be cool with that and, and get it. Did you have a follow-up to that specifically? Yeah, I was just going to ask you how many people do you consider a Okay, so the question is how many people should you test with? Uh, so the answer I like to give is at least one. <laughs> I mean, if you're, yeah, if, if you're doing like a, like a really big site, uh, a lot of testing, something really complex, it's useful usually to have, I think three to five people is fine. I don't really know that you, you end up getting a lot more data from doing more than five people usually. Uh, but even just showing it to a, a couple people, I feel like, is, is better than not showing it to anybody at all. I think that's another big trend, too, just to go back to one of our first questions, is this focus on user testing and getting a lot of that insight early on and throughout the whole process of design and not just like, okay, we're at the end, we're ready to launch, let's, let's do some testing. Um, because at that point, it might be too late to go back or, you know, you might be out of budget or out of scope. So um, definitely doing those little checks throughout the way is always helpful. Yeah, make sure you're on the right path as you're as you're going along. Sure. But I would also just like to throw in, like, don't become obsessed with the user testing either, because I've definitely seen it go completely the other way, where people have been so focused on getting whatever percentage or number that they're trying to hit that they stop caring what the site looks like or its functionality or whatever, because they get so focused on that data. So it's it's finding that balance. I will share one mistake that I made, and then we can go to the next question. Uh, okay, and then that will probably be the last one. Uh, yeah, so when I worked for BU, I did lots and lots and lots of print stuff for uh, for conferences, and they're super text heavy. They still are. And one of the first ones I did that we printed 60,000 copies of, 
which scared the hell out of me because it was like one of the first things I had done on my first job out of college. Uh, we spelled mammogram wrong. <laughs> uh, we had spell check. We spelled it wrong. Uh, I didn't notice it because I looked at it for so long that, I don't know, I couldn't tell. That's another thing. Always get someone else to proofread your stuff. Uh, I couldn't tell. My conference manager found it, and she looks at me and she goes, just don't say anything. We're not going to say anything. If the course director doesn't see it, just we're just going to let it go. And we did, and he never saw it, and it was fine. And inevitably, over the years, things like that happened again, because there's always going to be something that you spell wrong. Yeah. Uh, but that was terrifying when it was like, when it's your first big, monstrous print project in your first job out of school, and you're like, oh my god, I have messed up. It couldn't have been like the 300 copy, like digital print run that we did. No, it was the like, really way. So, anyway. Do we have any more questions? We've got about five minutes. Uh, yeah, in the back. You want to come up to the microphone? Hi, Karen. Thank you. Um, I just have a general question about design trends in the simplest form, color, um, user expectations in terms of navigation and things like that, and then within that, what you guys like and don't like that's currently trending. Um, so we kind of started with this question a little bit. Okay. Um, but let's see. I can tell you one thing that I hate, but it's not just it's not just web design. It's kind of across the board. For the love of God, will people stop using papyrus every time they design <laughs> a life, like like a natural lifestyle brand or or something that's got some kind of historical context? Like, please. Stop using it and stop using Herculaneum as your backup. It's so I funny. I saw you. <laughs> Don't do it. It's like one of those trends that will never go away. It's always no. going to be a problem for the his the history of web design yeah, <laughs> or I any mean, design. It's, it's in web design. It's in branding. It makes me absolutely nuts. And yeah, that's that's my big one. That's that's like another whole talk. We could have that another whole talk, talk on just bad font choices. So, yeah. Obviously, yeah. Comic Sans would be up there yeah. if, if, if you use it in the wrong way. If you're like a child daycare, you could maybe get away with it, right. but yeah. that's that's like another whole talk. It's a very small percentage that you can get away with that. Yeah. Although, I do love the trend, I guess not really a trend, but the fact that there are so many more high quality fonts available <coughs> for the web yes. that people are using. Great point. Yeah. There's the counter trend though of going away from web fonts and going back to like, uh, like browser safe default fonts. Um, like WordPress now, uh, all the UI font is uh, is your system font, so it's a usually a performance concern because you can go kind of in the total opposite direction where you use a ton of fonts uh, or like a ton of font weights takes up a lot of space, uh, slows down your site. So fonts sparingly, and also maybe we should start exploring default fonts again. Mm -hmm. um, like learn, learning typography, whole other talk. But relevant to, to that. Yeah, that's to go back to uh, your this gentleman here about your point about what to learn. Uh, learn typography. Yes. Look into typography. Read all about it. Take some courses if there's any courses about it. Specific to the web. Yeah. Specific to web typography. Yes. I mean, generally, just the concepts of ty typography will help you tremendously. Whether you're a graphic, print, web designer, whatever it may be. Yeah. Uh, it's all it's all core to it's, typography. It's, it's not so much related to web design, but kerning is super important. Uh, yeah. anyway, I think we will end on that note because I think <laughs> our time is up. Yeah. So um, thank you guys for coming. Yeah, we'll be around.